thanks for everyone that uh, that came out. Um, we knew that so the scheduling was going to be a little weird because we have part four talks today. Um, and but this was when David was going to be in town, so we appreciate him coming by to meet with people and um, chat about research. And we appreciate you guys coming to hear his seminar. Um, so David Lloyd is a, um, a biomechanical engineer and a bioengineer from um, Griffiths University in Queensland, Australia. Um, he's a professor in the Menzies Institute. Um, there's this, this really long list of um, accolades and um, leadership positions that David uh, holds. And so it's um, quite a privilege to have him here um, to speak to us today. But actually what I wanted to address was, um, so bio bioengineering is a relatively new field um, in the grand scheme of things, really. And David uh, has been a bioengineer since uh, the 80s, I guess, right? So huh. a little over 30 years. Um, no, a little under. At least that might be a little under 30 years. He's been a bioengineer for five years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, I think in bioengineering, you kind of have, we were talking about this today, you have um, sort of traditional engineers that come into biology and medicine, and you have people from the biological medical backgrounds that come into sort of engineering. Um, and similar to a lot of people who kind of started up the field, um, David's background was in aeronautics engineering, um, and he then, uh, or he got a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, worked in industry for some time, so has that kind of rigorous engineering approach, and a really kind of mechanics and mechanistic um, philosophy behind a lot of the work that he does. Um, and he took that and got a PhD in biomedical engineering um, and started working on the neuromusculoskeletal system. So I think what's kind of really fun about listening to David uh, talk is that he approaches it with this sort of fundamental desire to understand the mechanistic and mechanical features underlying a system. And I think that's something that um, as an institute, that's sort of a focus of a lot of the work that we do and it's a focus of a lot of the models that we try to put together. Um, and so I think it's, it's um, gonna be really, um, really cool to hear David speak today. Um, I had to throw in that um, one of the things that put David on the map for me was a paper that he did um, with Tor actually, when Tor was doing his graduate work. Um, and that paper um, really took the world by storm. It was on um, EMG driven uh, muscle simulations. And so I think that was a huge push in, in our field of neuromusculoskeletal biomechanics. And, um, and so it's going to be a real treat to hear him speak today. So without further ado, uh, Dave Lloyd. Thank you. You shouldn't clap now. You should clap at the end because you don't know what's coming. Um, <laughs> you might not want to clap, although I'll take it now. Um, you'll also guess that, and Toil will attest to this, that I'm the father of bad jokes. Um, true. true. <laughs> um, this has been, yeah, I was talking to one of my postdocs the other day and I say oh we've been doing this for 15 years this stuff he says sorry it's 25 and I go is it I'm going oh that's also a sign of the brain and getting older and all that sort of stuff so um Jeff was right I like mechanistic based research um I'm probably and I hate epidemiology with a fashion passion and um although I do see the need for it um, and at the moment, and as you'll see, we've been hijacked by that model for understanding health conditions. So what I'm hoping to show you here is that we can join mechanistic with a probabilistic based approach to understanding health conditions. So that was really my journey to being here. And uh, the other journey uh, vision I had was that, is that from a we know a lot about mechanobiology and biology at the lower levels, but we don't know how to map that to the person in the real world. And so my sort of catch cry or five second grab is to connect mechanobiology to the person in the real world. That's what we're trying to do. And, um, and we're making uh, baby steps at the moment going down that direction, but I'm hoping that I can also paint a a picture of where we should be going to enable that, that vision to occur. Um, so let's get into this. This is a really strange place to start, but I think it's lovely because it shows the value of physics-based models. So we've got Higgs boson for subatomic particles and subnuclear particle, and we've got uh, cosmological um, physics as well, both ends of the size scale. Um, so what we've got here is Higgs with a conceptual model and a mathematical model of the subatomic particle, subnuclear particles, predicted that there's got to be this god particle called the Higgs boson, which holds the whole nucleus together. 
And we've been searching for this for, I think it was late 40s, 50s that Higgs pr proposed this. And it was only four years ago, I think, we actually found it, the Higgs boson. And um, lo and behold, it was there, as predicted by a physical, conceptual and physical model of the system. Same as Einstein's gravitational waves, is that he, he sort of turned physics on the head and said that gravity is just a function of weight of masses in a space-time continuum and you've got this two-dimensional space-time continuum, three-dimensional, you put a mass in it, you rotate masses around, which are planets, and you should see waves like what you happen when you throw a ball or something in, in a pond. You'll see that. And, he, and that's the prediction of relativity, general relativity, and we've been searching for that for, you know, since the late 1920s, early. So, and lo and behold, they, they turn up. So what we learn from these two studies, if we have a very good physical, conceptual, mathematical model, of a physics-based system, we predict things that should be. On the other side of things, this has actually showed up in the papers about a month ago, as after the death of Catherine Morowitz. She was a mathematician and applied mathematicians, and she was, at the time, um, when we were just getting um, subsonic to um, um, supersonic flight, that you get this um, sonic boom, which is separation of the air from the aerofoil. And they were trying to get rid of that sonic boom and they were doing a very empirical approach as they were looking at all different shapes of aerofoils and testing them in, in a wind tunnel and see which one actually got rid of the sonic boom. Kathleen Morowitz actually did a computational model of this and showed that the actual variations that you get in normal airflow, it's never physically possible not to have a sonic boom. And you're always going to get separation. So this is basically telling us where we can't do research. And it stopped this empirical based research in its, in, its, in its tracks. So it changed the direction of that research into aerofoil design. So you've got two things. You know, physics based models will tell you where we can do research and where we can't do research, where it's not physically possible. So, welcome Sheldon, who watches. And this is, I think, is a lovely state of play at the moment in omics studies and it's a, it's a comment which and the scene is is Sheldon is reading to Amy a uh, bedtime story because she's feeling crook and she, uh, Sheldon's trying to help Amy out and Amy's lapping it up and Sheldon says while reading a genetics textbook I can't get a picture of the genetics textbook but but and the control group displayed significantly fewer genetic abnormalities. Because, but because of the flaws in the experimental design relating to environment, diet, and, I'll add, and physical activity, they lived inconclusively ever after. <laughs> and Amy's response, that was great, rub my chest again. Um, <laughs> but again, this shows the absolute state of play in the omics-based studies, right? If I know what's going on here, then I describe everything without taking some of the really huge effects into account and like epigenetics and all that sort of stuff. So, this is our problem with musculoskeletal conditions and research in this area. On the smaller size scales, we have biology and biochemistry, molecular, cellular, we have all the omics under the sun, you know, that list is growing every day. We've got animal models. Then on the other size of the uh, size scale, we've got people in the real world where you do epidemiology studies and randomised control trials and prospective cohort studies. And then you've got these human-based studies where you take a human into a lab and you test them and do all sorts of stuff. So the idea is to try and make sense of all this. Right? But I'm, and this is all pretty shaky because of all the types of analysis methods that we're using. We try and throw biostatistics at it, which is fairly elementary statistics, really. And we try and work out what these connections are. And so it's all based upon linear statistical models, you know, uh, correlation does not equal causation. That's my catch try. And so you can make any of these associations, but it doesn't mean anything. It just means there's some sort of numerical association. Problem. So what I'm proposing is that, well, now we've got a different <coughs> paradigm. Um, we've got our bioinformatics and data analytics and all these other types of 
you know, big data analysis on one side of the cube and the other side you've got all these physics-based computational models. I can list these as well. You've got computational biomechanics, which is a field on you, I mean computational biology. You've got all sorts of different physics-based models to study the human or biological systems. Now the, the issue is, is these are probabilistic models and these are physical deterministic models. The question is, is how do we stick these things together? That's the crucial element. And I think with that, you need a fundamental framework to build your studies. And it's all based upon musculoskeletal tissue homeostasis. So this is the view I'm taking. So basically, you've got this structure of some sort of musculoskeletal tissue, bone, cartilage, ligaments, menisci, doesn't matter. And you, the biomechanics apply, is applied to this structure. And from that, you get some sort of stress-strain distribution within this structure. And this is some of our um, multifocal, confocal, um, or multi-wavelength confocal stuff of tendons. And then you get this strain which triggers a biological cascade. And that biological cascade then alters the structure. And, you, and this is governed by the biochemistry. So that's the, the milieu that the person's tissues actually live in. And you go in this cyclic everlight going, this is going on all the time. And so most tissues in the body are going under this um, uh, regenerative remodeling state. The question is, is how do we tap into that regenerative model, remodeling, remodeling? And this is where I think we should be going. And so that's been the driver of most of it, a lot of our research in the last 10 years. And it's based upon this concept of appropriate and inappropriate loading. This is a paper that we did after our tendon-based studies and basically we propose that they're on one axis here, this is a strain and here you've got musculoskeletal tissue damage, you go from disuse up into the physiological range, we get small ruptures in the, in the actual extracellular matrix until you get complete rupture. So that's the strain damage um, pathway. On the other hand you've got this tissue remodeling going on in the background and so in this area there, which, we, which is where you get this anabolic growth of the tissue. We all know that, you know, if you go down to the gym and pump iron, as I do, not, um, is that you can grow muscles, bones and all that sort of stuff. We call that the Goldilocks region, or yeah, that's what we're, we're calling it now, the Goldilocks region, where we should be doing training appropriate for the current tissue state. If you're on either side of it, you get catabolic breakdown due to overloading and it just can't keep up with the, the rupture state going on or disuse is that if it's not being used you get this catabolic breakdown of the tissue. In both cases you get de deterioration of the tissue. The idea is to be in this anabolic zone there. This has other dimensions as well which is on other axes you know frequency, um, duration, duty cycles and all that. Um, but this concept there is this region of Goldilocks that you want to be in. The question is, how do you get there? So this is what we always thought osteoarthritis the need to be, is that it used to be overloading. And it was based upon studies which looked at the external adduction moment on the knee during walking. And when this adduction moment in stance, it concentrated the load on the medial compartment of the knee, which is the site of deterioration in, in the knee joint. You can see it here. And this was thought to be an overloading response. So the higher the adduction moment, the faster the deterioration. Um, and I actually, that was the impetus from a lot of my early research. And, um, but I was always interested, well, this is just external loading. What's going on inside the joint? What's that force there and that force there? And what's the stress strain in those tissues? And so this overloading has been shown in um, animal studies and you can see the major effect on breakdown of the cartilage. The other problem is, is that here's a list of other studies of if different types of loading regimes which give you the same effect. You've got no loading, impact loading and static loading. So the question is, which one is it? And at the moment, I would have to say, I don't know. Um, but here are all the neuromuscular biomechanical <coughs> characteristics which have been shown in a person with osteoarthritis. Right? And this is the possible alterations to the articular loading in these people or in this population. You've got at the, 
they do less moderate and high intensive physical activity. That means the articular surfaces are loaded for less often. So these are just thought experiments too. Um, knee adduction moments are different. So you get altered distribution of the loading between the medial and lateral compartments. Flexion extension moments are different. So you get different extension muscle forces being applied to the articular surfaces. They have slower walking speed. That means the surfaces are loaded for longer periods of time. They're more flexed and reduced range of motion. That means there's concentrated load over a smaller range area of contact. There's, they're more, whoops, they're more internally or externally rotated. That means there's a different articular part of the surface being loaded. And then there's atrophy of the muscles. You get muscle atrophy, which basically means there's smaller muscle forces being applied to the articular surfaces. Then there's arthrogenic muscle inhibition, again, which says there's smaller muscle forces being applied to the articular surfaces. But then there's higher co-contraction of the muscles surrounding the joint, which will increase the number of muscle forces being applied to the articular surfaces. So you tell me what's going on. I'm going home, don't I? So, but so the issue is to get at this story, it's all about integration. You've got to put all these things together to actually understand what's going on in osteoarthritis and what I'm proposing is all other musculoskeletal conditions. So integration, how do we do it? Now let's go to the engineering world and there's this new thing called digital engineering. Um, this concept is that uh, you've got concept design or concept development, design, test and evaluation, production, operate it, then maintain it and it's this cycle going on, but it's all, a, all based upon having a digital twin of the engineering asset that you're trying to manage, design and manage. Here's some examples of digital twins, which are actually in uh, wind turbines, uh, gas turbines in, in aircraft, actual cars, engines. So all these are produced engineering asset with a digital twin, which allows you to man design and manage that asset. So, but, and this is a reminder to the world, even in engineering, and this is, was Google's creating um, um, drones to drop off, um, it was actually in remote Australia, um, drop off um, large supplies and things like that. They reckon they could do it for cheaper and faster. It failed because they started to use a data-based approach to doing it. So what they didn't do, they didn't include a physical model. And this is the comments afterwards, and I raised this one down there, I hope you can see it, and I'll, I'll just say it. Bad things happen when you neglect physics. <laughs> <laughs> Important take-home message. Okay, so the digital twin is what I'm calling the personalised digital human. So that's the end goal. And that's what we should be focusing on. And this is what I'm, and this changes talk to talk. Um, and, and I'm going through each one of these steps and hopefully it's a representation of that digital engineering laid out in the human or biological health space. So it's a pathway and process. So we start out with big data. We've got community-based data. So you've got wearable sensors and iPhones and Fitbits. You've got medical records. Then you've got whole body, where you've got shape models and motion capture and all that. Then you've got organ level. Then you've got tissue level. So this is down to the actual, well, this is, you can see tissues. Then you get down to the micro level or meso level. I'm not sure what that's called. Ashley Ash and I were having this discussion. I've got no idea. And then you go now to the nano level where you've got bloods and genome and all that. You've probably seen all that as well before because that's pretty standard Peter Hunter talk. Um, the issue is, is this concept of personalisation. That's the step forward, I think. And this is actually coupled with a 4D model creation. There's been a lot of focus currently on fitting the 3D anatomy of bones with implants and things like that. I'm saying that's now a consumer item, that's been done, you know, a couple, number of companies are doing that. I don't know if it, that 3D thing that fits the person's anatomy is going to break or not break, it's going to function or not function. This is about 4D. So you need a functioning physical digital twin. So the idea is you create these digital representations from an imaging sense, you create functional models um, from this imaging work and motion capture data. Then you've got motion capture data which you can now drive these actual uh, anatomical models 
and then you've got selected finite element models of different tissues. All these are important because each, some of these things is that young lady's over there, just got to, <laughs> is that these are finite element models of selected tissues that you can actually do studies on that you've got to have the right muscle forces to get the right muscle force boundary conditions to apply to these. That's really quite crucial. And then you can go one step further is you can go down to some computational biology muscle, um, sorry, um, models that allow us to work out what the stress remodeling or strain remodeling framework is. I'm going to concentrate a lot of my time on these higher size scales here, but I just want to say that's really an area and really it's only because I just haven't added that part to my talk yet. So it's, it's sort of coming. Um, this is the modelling methods that we are going down to continual level stress strain. This is what we do. So, uh, so some of you will actually recognise some of this stuff. This is the map. This is some work from UWA of a PhD student of mine. Again, this is big data. This is all types of big data. So it's an, um, form you know, and functional data which is, you'll hear those two words popping up a lot, form and function. Then you create models from the imaging work and then you drive them using motion capture data or wearable tech data to um, mobilise it. And this is rigid body neuromuscular skeletal modelling which actually estimates forces which can be applied to the isometed um, um, tissues. And these are all the different software at the moment that is used in that process and that's part of the problem. We don't have a unified platform that allows us to stitch all this together in a nice uniform way. It's a major issue. And then you can design an intervention. I break it, break it down into four, three areas. You what we call intelligent training or intelligent rehab where you give real-time biofeedback of tissue or stress loading or tissue strain. Um, you've got um, some sort of orthosis or something like that that you can wear which can be designed and to get some sort of desired output of tiss for tissues or you can do some sort of surgery where you design a surgery, an orthopedic surgery or, or a like to get some desired output for an intervention. So that's where I think that you can use these, um, the personalised digital human. Then one, but you can then use intervention a 4D simulation to actually develop and design that intervention. And so you can look at stress strain in tissues. Again, this is some of our work. So, um, and this is some of our colleagues' work um, in, the, in the computational biology. This is a tendon remodelling model and this is a cartilage remodelling model. So these actually do work from a comput or exist from a computational. So you can actually pass the external down to the tissue level um, areas. This is for implants. This is again some of our colleagues' work. Uh, this is our work that we did on the Grand Challenge. This is looking at articular loading in implants using rigid body modelling, uh, neuromusculoskeletal modelling applied to an implant. This is some of Mark Taylor's work at Flinders University. These are subject specific bones but with generic loading. So you can look at the stress strain. If you join the two up, you've now got a powerful technique in which you can vary the, the light. Um, I'm not that much in charge of the, Oh, that is better actually. No, you've got the front one on Is this here? You keep talking on what Oh, no. I'll keep talking. I'll just point. It's better than when it's dark, you can't see me. Um, okay. So you. So you've got these 4D simulations, then you can produce. And I think the other interesting thing is now we're at an amazing point in history and technological history where all these technologies collide. And now we have additive manufacturing because it allows us to create personalised devices and implants and wearables. So you've got um, metal printing, you can print implants and, and, and alike. You've got multi-plastic printers and where you can print different plastic articles. You've got biologics where you can print different biological tissues, so you've got metal plastic, and you've also got some of these regenerative tissue engineering methods that you can throw at this. So we've got this amazing collision of all these different technologies, but these need to be enabled using some sort of digital model of the person. 
then you need to test the and test and evaluate your intervention. I mean that really the device. You got ex vivo or physical testing, so make sure that your design pathway is actually producing something which we expect to, to be designed and to function. You've got to do that. So that's testing that part. But even after you print it, and this is going to a person, you've got to do non-destructive testing because you don't know what the printer's printed. You think it's printed what you think it's printed, but you don't know if it's got voids, it's got geometry, it's got cracks in it, it's got inclusions in it, or it's actually geometrically what you said you wanted. So you've got to do that as well. So this is a something which needs to be included in this pathway. And then you implement the intervention. Now this is uh, a surgery. You've got your implant. You've got now, you've got one upstairs, which I'm jealous about, uh, uh, robotic surgery. But you've also got um, drilling guides and cutting guides which can be designed to fit the bone and so you can do a drill and do the cuts and drills where they should be. You give this to the purse, to the surgeon, but the other important thing to do the surgery, but the other important thing is this feedback pathway. Right? This needs to go back into the big data and personal data. The same thing can happen with um, using intelligent orthoses. You've got orthoses with wearable tech attached to it and again you've got this feedback into, and it could be even wireless because we can do that now, into big data and personal data. So that goes back into feed this uh, virtual cycle. And then if I training or I rehab where you want to look at loading of actually an articular surface in real time um, and use it for governing training and this is actually real time articular loading inside the knee, this is one of our technologies, coupled with um, wearable tech you feed it back into big data again. So that actually completes the complete cycle. So you're closing the loops to improve the intervention. But you also got subloops in here as well. So if you got an intervention for d simulation, you can actually you can change the design. And if I test the, the product produced item, physically tested or um, or non-destructively tested, it can change this production method as well. And there's also a feedback loop there. There's all sorts of feedback loops which allows you to improve the final product and intervention. But you've also got a big data analysis in just in this collecting this data here and running this model over and over again, you can actually start to build up an understanding of what works and what doesn't work. So now you've got a lot of different ways to improve your intervention. But fun that the underlying thing here is if you create this technology, which I call the personalized digital human, it's got to adhere to all these things at the moment. You've got data privacy, data on model security, standards and benchmarking to make sure your model is actually predicting what it should be predicting. Quality control of the data, model and produced items. An outcomes registry to make sure you're actually getting better outcomes or not getting better outcomes. IP protection because this is a technology hopefully which will allow, enable new technologies to be produced, new devices, implantables and wearables. There's got to be some sort of IP protection woven into this. The regulators are absolutely crucial here because at the moment um, personalised devices that are going in people's bodies flies under all regulatory radars is that you can put it in based upon it's an experimental method. <coughs> Does, right? It's a big problem. FDA, TGA, all these bodies are, are worried about personalised implantable and, and really implantable devices. In the end it's got to make economic and business sense as well. It's got to be financially viable. So you've got to put all this together to create this platform so you can create these new devices. So what's the current state? And I think we're at early days here and I'll just go through what I think the current state is. Um, again, it's form and function. That's what we're trying to produce in the, in the personalised digital human. And there are three stages to doing this. First is to actually create the model. So you create it directly from form or anatomy, from medical imaging or atlases. Function, motion capture, wearable tech and atlases, again, can all feed into creating that functional aspect. Then you've got to calibrate and tune the 4D model to parameters because you want to make sure this actually predicts the data that you think it should be predicting. 
So you can predict measured experimental data, literature data or population or atlas data. All this is stuff is necessary to tune the models. This is an example of the different things that we're, we're actually tuning currently in our modelling. We've got muscular tendon parameters, excitation dynamics, bone geometry, joint geometry, tissue material properties, all these things are in a tuning process. Then you've actually got a, now got a functioning 4D model. Then you can actually make this move with motion capture or wearable tech data or motion data from an atlas that allows you to actually run the models. So this is what the current state of the art is that's used fairly much around the world. And unfortunately it's actually commonly called subject specific model which I cringe at. No, I don't cringe at, I yell and scream at. Um, this is not subject specific model. Basically you've got this scale generic model which is driven by motion capture data. You do inverse kinematics to get joint kinematics, inverse dynamics to get joint moments. You've got muscle actor electromography hanging off here and you've got all these different joint moments and you've got all these activation patterns and you try and put them all together and trying to make sense of what's actually going on. It's hard. It's really hard to do that. The next step down is um, the, the really important thing is that that is a scaled generic model. Right? And basically you just linearly stretch it all in the three directions. There's no rotational um, um, changing from marker positions and height. And doing that, you change all these things in the model. All of them get changed. And they're usually just linearly scaled. Who says they're right? No one. Well, a lot of people do when they say, oh, I've just created a subject-specific model. That's the problem. So, and then we go to try and predict muscle tendon forces, and we use a static or dynamic, dynamic optimization. And this is all done because it's in OpenSim or anybody, the standard packages that we use now. And that's standard fare to get muscle tendon forces. Then we have, now as I launch into why we do EMG driven, I know most, I don't know, no, there's a lot of younger people here, so you might not have heard of this. Um, so the neuromuscular, the musculoskeletal system is redundant in muscles. We've got more muscles than necessary to generate movement, problem. So there's no closed form solution for the muscles. Um, so it's an undetermined system. In other words, the number of muscles is greater than two times the mechanical degrees of freedom um, because only muscles, they can only generate tension, they can't do compression, so you've got to have muscles on both sides of the joint. So what that means is that you need a neurally driven solution for the problem. So the go-to has been static or dynamic optimization, which minimises some sort of cost function, like minimise activation squared, total muscle force squares, energy expenditure, there's a whole list of them there. We tend to go, this tends to be the go-to one, activation squared, because it's in open sim. Um, but, there's a big but, for the same biomechanical conditions, so same joint moments and same joint position, optimization will lead to the same neural solution because it's a mathematical construct. But if different neural solutions exist for the same biomechanics between different people they have different muscle activation patterns that are affected by training and disease for exactly the same biomechanics. Gets worse than that. In the per same person, the person will have different neural solutions depending upon the control task. If it's force control or movement control, if it's force control or position control, if there's different externally applied joint impedance or stability or learning, all these things impact on the type of neural solutions used by people. So why do we use static optimization? We've been asking that for 20 odd years or nearly 30 years or whatever it is. So we've developed over a period of time and Paul, I did it in my postdoc, Paul was my first PhD student, he extended it and there's been a whole list of, there's been about, I don't know, about 10 PhDs, postdocs and now worked upon this process which in 2015, we put it all together in something which we call calibrated EMG informed neuromusculoskeletal modelling toolbox, which we called Cinemas. Um, and this, this is the paper which we released from it, and the software is a plug in for OpenSim or it's standalone. So you can use it, and it has a range of different neural solutions from EMG driven, EMG assisted, all the way through to static optimization. You can use any different neural solution on exactly the same biomechanics that you record for a person on the same musculoskeletal model. So it allows you to play around with the neural stuff, which is cool. 
So now we have cinemas which allows us, driven by activation patterns, to produce muscle tendon forces. And now we can work out loading on or stress and strain of tissues. So that's where we currently are. Validity, benchmarking sticks up its ugly head, as it should do over and over again. A model is only as good as the data it predicts. Um, so, this is, what's, this is how cinemas work, very briefly. We take EMG-derived neural inputs and joint angles. We apply it to a scale generic model of the musculoskeletal system. We have activation model. We have a muscle tendon model. We can calculate joint muscle moments. We sum them up and we can calculate joint moments by that pathway there. Then we can measure joint moments by any sorts of different methods, inverse dynamics directly from a Biodex machine. This is what happens. This is actually, this is your data. <laughs> yeah, so this is, good. it looks good. <laughs> Before calibration. So what we do, we introduce a calibration step, right, where we tune some of the parameters in this model. And I won't go into that. But we tune it. And then you've now got a tuned or calibrated model. And at that point, you can predict all these other outputs. And I'll just list them there. But there's the important outputs of muscle forces and stiffness and muscle kinematics, all this sort of stuff that can be produced as output for cinemas. How well does it work? This is Tor's work. <laughs> just, um, this is when he had hair. Um, hey. Oi. <laughs> In other words, this is predicted by cinemas um, and this is measured in inverse dynamics. This is for me in different tasks. This is on a biodex, that one, this is in running, and that's the flexion extension moment. Um, the other important thing was that it was able to predict across with minimal adjustment across weeks. So you kept the same anatomical model and muscle tendon physiological parameters pre and post or over a two week period and you're still able to predict joint torques which is an important thing, is that once you've got a calibrated model, it's pretty good. It gets better than that, and this is part of the grand challenge. A lot of you might have heard of the grand challenge competition. Tor and I were part of this. Um, so we represented EMG informed modeling methods. Um, and this is one of the, the hallmark papers which came out of our perspective, where we did the best job possible at, the, at that time of, of from a subject specific method. And this is some of Paul and Jerusa's postdoctoral work. So Grand Challenge basically said, we had these people walking around in North America, they had instrumented knee implants that you can measure the medial joint, lateral joint contact forces. This is the measured medial joint contact forces. We also measured all other manner of data in which we could create a subject specific model. Imaging and motion capture data and biodex data and all that sort of stuff. And the idea is, can this pathway predict those? That's basically it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we tried, and this is with an EMG driven method, so implicit we assume that we needed to include EMG driven. So this is a scale generic versus a subject specific. So we created these subject specific models very laboriously for each patient, for each person. And we said, what's the difference between predictions? Um, scale generic, subject specific. Scale generic, subject specific. Mm -hmm. You get the idea. No. Um, it gets worth the lateral compartment is that um, static optimization always predicts unloading in the lateral compartment of the knee, which never happens. EMG driven always predicts lateral compartment loading. So that's another thing which is important to remember. But if you mess up the um, muscle tendon parameters in here, you can double that even in a subject specific model. You will get bad predictions if you mess up some of these other factors or other parameters in the model. So this has told us what we need to include in a subject specific model. This is all of them. This is my view and, and skeletal and segmental anatomy, 3D joint anatomy, 3D six, no, joint 6D mechanics, muscular tendon pathways, muscular tendon anatomy, muscle tendon physiological properties, external loading and muscle activation patterns or movement external loading. So we've done that for a long, long time, well, our group and people attached to us, but we've not really done that part of it. And the reason is, is that we use motion capture to collect and get that, gather that data. This data actually comes from medical imaging. 
So the idea is to combine medical imaging and motion capture together. And that's, so we've been working on that fairly heavily as TOR's group and all you guys have been, is trying to come up with these subject specific models based upon medical imaging pathways. So I'm going to explain to you where we are currently from a rigid body modelling perspective. So we started with the open sim 2392, which is basically 23 degrees of freedom, 92 muscles. Is that right? Or is it the other way around? I can't remember. So that's what we started off with. So these are all the components of the model. This is what we ended up with. So the things which are crossed out are the only thing in common is there's still 92 muscles. That's it. That's the only thing in common with the 2392 muscle uh, model. So this is this is a current subject specific lower limb model. Uh, Sorry, what's 23 again? 23 degrees of freedom, oh. 92 muscles. Yep. So that's where we currently are. So this is how we're doing it. We get skeleton segmented from MRIs, we get the bone geometry, we get geometry of the cartilage um, ligaments and create and do segmentation of those from these MRs and which can incidentally go into a finite element. Musa, where is he? Um, but it also can be used to create a rigid body model and so I'm going to focus on that where we fit different geometric objects to the different articulating surfaces and ligaments and all that sort of stuff. Um, these have been based upon cadaveric work but now we've moved it into an MRI derived geometrical um, property um, derivation. So, but the problem is it doesn't necessarily work. Now there's a surprise. Um, what you do is, and I'll focus just there, can we kill the lights? See that line just there? That dotted line? You can see there's actually a discontinuity there. And there's one there. You can see those? Actually leave the lights off, that's fine. And so, first of all, out of the box, off an MRI, it produces discontinuities and because it's actually quite a tightly controlled mechanism from a rigid body perspective. Secondly, we wanted to publish the patterns or um, follow the patterns of published data. So we got a whole lot of um, data from cadaveric studies and other studies and compiled it together and we tried to follow the patterns. So we had different types of optimization or tuning of the model. First to get rid of discontinuities and the other one to, pub to follow the patterns of published data. So this is our Basically, and this is for the tibiofemoral joint, patellofemoral joint, and talocural joint. So this is the tibiofemoral and patellofemoral and the talocural joint. These are five-bar mechanisms, five-bar mechanisms. This is a, another five-bar mechanism or six-bar mechanism which actually is based upon the tibiofemoral. So we churn it, we get rid of the discontinuities, and we can get close to the published data. That's the green curves there. So we've published that. And now we assemble all that into a skelete, lower limb skeletal model in open sim. So this is a rigid body lower limb model in open sim. We've trimmed away the, the body, the body skin and all the soft tissues there. But um, so that's in preparation, that paper. And this is some of the validation work we're now doing. And I've just selected the patellofemoral kinematics from MRIs, where we've got the joints in different postures in an in MRI. The green is the is the final. Uh, calibrated tuned model and the red dots are from the MRIs. So you can see the green model is actually tracking the, the experimental data which is pretty good. So we, you've got to be doing this validation all along the line. So now we're in the process of sticking muscles into these skeletal, mo into these skeletal models. So we're now doing segmentation of muscles as a lot of, well, I don't know if a lot of you guys are doing from which we can get volumes and cross-sectional areas, we can get origins in insertions, and we can also derive wrapping surfaces and via points from the bones and positions of pathways of muscles. So that's where we currently are. And now we can take all this data into what we call this uh, fully subject-specific lower limb rigid body model. That's where we currently are. We're working on better methods to create those currently. Um, and I won't go into that. Um, but that's uh, an optimization tuning as well. So now 
The process is a subject specific rigid body model with cinemas to incorporate activation patterns into subject specific models of the um, for final analysis. So that's where we currently are. This is some of our work in the children's hospital in uh, Lady Salento in Brisbane where, where this has been translated into um, gait analysis for paediatric patients, um, skiffy, just CPs, um, patellofemoral dislocators. Um, this is the patellofemoral dislocator. That is to the side of the joint. It should be there. It's not there. Right? That's where it is normally. So we've, we're asked, can we do a patella dislocator model from the MRIs and motion capture? And you can see the difference straight away. You can see where the patella is riding lateral and alta compared to the control participant. We now also have a dislocated model where the cut, where the patella actually articulates on the outside of the knee. So, so um, in theory, so it's a theoretical one. <laughs> Sorry, but unfortunately, it does actually go there um, in some kids. So, so that's now into there, and this is some of our stuff: the uh, slip capital femoris epiphysis, the skiffy um, patients, and so much. I think you guys are doing the same thing. We're mirroring. The unaffected leg with the affected leg, we select the cutting plane in consultation with the surgeon. We do the osteotomy and we line these things, this bit up with the good head of the neck and of the femur and with the femoral condyles. Then we select the blade plate off the shelf to actually match that alignment. And then we stick that into open sim and see how that actually affects muscle tendon function. We haven't got actual um, gait. That's the next part of a grant that Chris Carty, who's got half a head, um, um, is doing now. So putting that into a gait model. And then you design this, these surgical accessories to actually do this surgery. You 3D print them. I always carry these with me because I think they're cool. And then we give them to the surgeon. We've actually got funding now to test that actual process um, in, so we'll be doing that starting 1st of December, that's when the new, uh, the new grant kicks off. This is our work on ACL reconstructed and this is again using part subject specific, part not. So this is when a person ruptures their ACL, they go in there strip out the um, semitendinous gracilis graft, um, they fold it up on itself, stitch it, um, they rip it out of the knee there, they stick a uh, drill up there and they stick the tendon up there, they locate it with an endo button there and an endo button there, that's an ACL reconstruction. Um, the problem is, is that this is the graft muscles, this, the gracilis semitendinosus on the surgical side. You can see it compared to the non-surgical side, you can see the, the contraction of those muscles, like they just atrophy. So what happened, and you can see sometimes they get tendons regeneration, sometimes they don't, but you always get this contraction or atrophy of the muscle. So our question, does that actually affect contact forces inside the knee during a range of activities? So we looked at walking, running and sidestepping and 104 ACL reconstructed and 60 matched healthy controls. You can see all the, the specs there of the people, this is medial compartment, lateral compartment and total loading. <coughs> the red is the control, the blue is, sorry, the, the red is control, blue is the ACL reconstructed and green is the grand challenge implant data, just to show we're predicting good, um, although they're not the same people. The take home message is in the medial compartment and the total joint contact forces across all modes of locomotion there was lower loading of the medial compartment and total uh, compartment loading in the ACL reconstructed. It gets more interesting than that, in that if you plot contact, lateral contact forces, medial contact forces and plot it versus the volume of the cartilage, um, in the controls you see this nice larger force, bigger volume cartilage, which is bigger force, bigger cartilage. In other words, it's looking on the optimal loading mechanobiologies <coughs> thing. And now you've got ACL reconstruction where you don't have that in the medial compartment and you do have it in the lateral compartment but not as strong for this group here, for the controls. It gets really much more interesting than that. 
And this is the presence of cartilage defects and bone marrow lesions in the, in the knee. And we've broken the group up into those who are pure ACL reconstruction and those who have a, a concomitant meniscal injury. And this is the, the odds ratio um, from, that you get from a generalised linear model. Um, now we are talking statistics. Um, and um, but the odds ratio for increasing contact forces. You can see if you've got increasing contact forces, you've got lower odds ratio of having cartilage defects. If you've got greater contact forces, you've got a lower odds ratio of having large bone marrow lesions. It gets more interesting than that. And that doesn't occur in the ACL plus meniscal injury. This is on a Mundemont's work from Germany, and this is um, time since surgery, ACL reconstruction just there. This is pre-surgery, cortical bone density and trabecular bone density. Now using PQCT, the grey top line is the unaffected leg or non-surgical leg, and the black circles are the operated leg. You can see there's loss of cortical bone and trabecular bone, bone mineral density post-surgery. They're also loading less. Is this a just a mechanobiological response to the loading conditions they experience? Gets even better on that. Um, this is Tom Buchanan, Lynn Snyder Mackler's group at U Delaware, who are using a, a similar ish EMG driven modelling to what we're doing. And this is ACL reconstructed at baseline directly after training <coughs> before surgery and uh, six months after one year and three years after surgery. And this, uh, the people broken up into those who went on and got OA and those who didn't get OA at five years out. So this is radiographic OA. The people who had, the people went on and got, got OA had lower joint contact forces in walking after surgery. They unloaded after surgery and they got osteoarthritis. So where are we on this mechanobiological curve for these people? The short answer, I'm now speculating. I don't know, but we, I'm really saying that we need, we need to know if we're going to create interventions for these people. You know, I'm suggesting ACL reconstructed purely might be on this side, but ones with <coughs> meniscal da damage might be over here. I don't know where NEO is, I don't know. It's probably different depending on the stage of the disease. So we now need to treat these people on a personalised basis. This is personalised medicine. Enter the personalised digital human, right? So, and this is personalised biofeedback. So this is our the neuromusculoskeletal modelling working in real time. So this is the joint contact forces in the medial compartment of the knee. We can select any tissue that you want. And this is just walking on instrumented treadmill with, in a biodex, uh, sorry, on a Vicon system with markers and EMGs and all that sort of stuff. Up here we're giving biofeedback to the person or their medial compartment loading in real time. We ask this person to actually, um, let's go, we start again, they're walking on normally and this person can co-contract their knee muscles at will. So we ask them to co-contract. You can see the jump in the joint contact forces when they start co-contracting. We also tell them to stop co-contracting and you'll see them jump back down again. Right. The other really interesting thing, when we looked at these people external loading, they had reduced knee adduction moments and reduced knee flexion extension moments. So they reduced their external loading, but they increased the articular loading because of the action of muscles. That's telling us that we just can't go on what's actually happening outside the body. It's reinforcing what we already know. But it's also being done in real time, so we can give people biofeedback on how to do this stuff, hopefully. So, I don't know if it works. That's a really good question. We can also develop uh, intelligent orthoses, which might help correct knee loading. Um, this is some of, it's actually an interesting case. Can we de design, and this is actually not a photo, this is actually a scanned in of our, one of our people and designing an orthosis to fit the person. So that's pretty cool. I don't know if that works, but it'd be interesting to find out. This is where we're putting it all together, the Achilles tendon. Um, again, refocus on tissue homeostasis. We found the Goldilocks region for tendon is around 6% strain uh, where, and where you get increased collagen 1 expression. This is actually, and beyond higher and below 
6% strain are the catabolic zones where you get loss of, uh, loss of tendon. So what we did is use deconditioned tendon uh, where they were at rest for six days and then we strained them for six days at 6% at 0.1 hertz cyclic strain in a bioreactor. So this is outside an animal. New Zealand, we do love you guys. New Zealand white rabbit in there, um, the tendons. So, and so we had different groups and this is six days rest, 12 days rest and six days plus 6% cyclic strain. You can see the collagen one expression jump up. Collagen one is the main um, protein polymer in, in tendon and many other structures in the body. And this is the change in maximum breaking load in those different groups. You can see native tendon gets weaker after six days rest, gets weaker again after 12 days rest. But you can also see this now jumps back up again after you give it 6% strain cyclic strain. This is in a bioreactor. So you can recover an isolated tendon in a bioreactor with appropriate strain conditions. So one of my colleagues asked, can we do this in people? I said, sure we can. So and it was based upon some of Vicky's work as well. And this is the following uh, paper from Vicky's work where Vicky did it in cadaveric tendon. This is a PhD student uh, now finished, uh, Banks Hansen, where we do um, scanning of the Achilles tendon using uh, 3D freehand ultrasound at rest and 60% maximum is isometric plantar flexion torques. And that, then we can recreate the loaded and unloaded geometry of that tendon. And then you can do a finer fitting the material properties to it, you can work out the stress strain in the actual tendon. Um, these are all different tendons from a random sample of PhD students in, the, in, our, in our lab. And you can first of all see all the different size tendons. And the second one, you can also see all the different locations of high stress and low stress. Again, it matters subject specificity. And this is, this, on this axis here is when you've got a fully subject specific geometry and material properties. On this axis you've got generic geometry and subject specific material properties and this is flipped. Subject specific geometry and generic material properties. Each one of these lines is a person, each one of those dots is a stress node. And basically what you can see is that you don't have an identity line if you've got generic geometry, you have an identity line, even with generic material properties, when you have subject specific geometry. Geometry is really, really important, at least in a healthy population. This is uh, tendinopathy versus Achilles tendinopathy people. This is the same conditions, but now you can see that the healthy have a Young's modulus of 1400 versus 600 for the tendinopathy tar. So this matters as well when you've, got a, when you've actually got a pathological population. There are also twisted tendons. And as Vicky might have, have you guys shown this stuff? Uh, to, to smaller audiences. Okay, good. well, I, the Achilles tendon is three subtendons that are twisted. And they go undergoing very levels of twist. You know, that's the anterior, the soleus is on the, on the anterior and the lateral and medial gastric are on the back and they twist immediately. And sometimes the soleus will go all the way around to the medial um, posterior site and all the way around. And that depends upon across it, depends on, upon the person basically. So Vicky actually did the modeling of this, implemented a theoretical amount of twist of the, f of the fibers, 0, 15, 30, and 45, and 60 degree twist, and looked at what that might do to the actual stress patterns experienced by the tendon. So this is a selected typical tendon where you've got a stress concentration at zero degrees and 60 degrees. But when you start winding it up and winding it down, you get this optimal area where you distribute and lower the joint, sorry, the, um, the stresses and strains. And that actually results in est greater rupture, estimated rupture load for, because you can distribute the stress in, in the tendon much better if the right amount of twist. So this is the subtraction UT MRI method. So this is for some of you guys, particularly that young person just there and Vicky, um, is that this is some of our newer stuff where you can actually see the Achilles tendon. And you can start to see how this is the proximal end, so you're going from distal to proximal. And you can start to see this, the different compartments 
moving around. And if you look at this in the three-dimensional regenerated, uh, recreated, you can start to see, they're not fascicles, but they're bundles of fascicles. And you can see it, you can run it down there. And I think from this you can actually work out uh, twist. And this is our first attempt from it using a Fourier Mellon transform method where you look at the, the distal end and proximal end and look at, and then you look at, and then you do this cross registration, look at the difference in the Fourier transform major uh, directions, and this predicts 28.3 degrees twist of the tendon. So that's just a gross effort. If, um, this might do it. We'll see. Um, and basically, you put all this stuff together. So you put real time neuromusculoskeletal modelling with um, these imaging methods to give you muscle forces applied to the Achilles tendon, stress strain in the tendon, in which you can create a surrogate model which works in real time, and then Attach, attached to the real-time neuromusculoskeletal modelling and that will give you biofeedback of that strain within the tendon. That's where we're currently going, assembling that together. Um, and this is, I just dropped this in for Ash's <laughs> stuff. This is something completely different and I won't go on beyond this. Um, this is in dinosaurs. So the question is, is what was the common posture of dinosaurs in locomotion? So the idea is, we had this young man here who came through the Australian system with a perfect score, had a GPA of seven out of seven. So, and you can also see him, if he's not cut off, he, he's Sheldon. Um, his name's Peter, but um, basically he, what he did is, apart from a whole lot of other things, he uh, segment uh, CT'd bones of of dinosaurs from all around the world, collated them or went and did themselves, created a musculoskeletal model in open sim for each animal, and then ran static optimization in different postures where you get a, a, a standing balance, um, where it balances all the center of mass and the ground reaction forces, so it's a quasi-static analysis. Then calculated the, <laughs> the muscle tendon forces using static optimization. Unfortunately, we couldn't get EMGs into these ones. Um, <laughs> And then we calculated, so we applied that to a finite model of the bone, and this is the principal um, strain, or stress tensors here, the primary and secondary. And at the same time, we did fabric tensors for the trabeculae in these bones off these things. And we changed this posture until they actually lined up. And so what we're able to do is get the, what we call the characteristic posture of the dinosaur. And we check this on chickens, as you do, um, to see if it actually works. And it works really quite well. So the idea is that you can use modelling with the bone to try and work out how these things actually moved. That's just cool. <laughs> so that's it. Um, there's a huge, huge set of team. We'll probably, a lot of people will probably see their names there. And um, with a lot of funding which has gone into it. And I thank all those people. It was great fun working with everyone. And uh, Thank you. All right. Well, we've gone a little bit uh, past five o'clock, uh, so if people need to leave to pick up small children or that kind of thing, then that's fine. But uh, if you oh, don't, damn. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't, then uh, we've got some, some time for a few questions. Um, so if you think of uh, one or a couple people to think of some questions to ask David. Um, I actually had, had one that I wanted to ask. Uh, so you had a slide where you talked uh, you, you talked a lot about putting EMG information directly into the model, yep. the EMG informed, EMG um, prescribed modeling. Um, and so sort of people on the other side of the coin would argue, well, if you withhold some of that data, model with you know n minus one of all of the available data, and then use that last piece yep, of data yep. to validate your model. Um, so you're I, I sort of agree that if you put in all of the data that you have, you're yep. going to get better, model, better models, but then how do you validate the model and demonstrate that it's working? Um, be creative about other data it's predicting. First of all, you're predicting... So, I'll step back. Um, there's EMG-driven is directly driven. You just throw EMG into it. If you're missing EMG, tough, and you just drive it with it. Now, now we've got new versions. One version we call a hybrid, which is a hybrid between static optimization and EMG-driven where you fill in the missing EMGs with static optimization. 
Then we have another one which is called EMG assisted, where you adjust the fill in the missing EMGs and adjust the EMGs to get better predictions of the joint moments. So, and so the idea you get this balance between predicting EMGs and predicting joint moments, right? And multiple joint moments, like you predict. I think we've got four or five joint moments that then we now predict across the whole lower limb. So you've got to predict all those, but you've still got to best predict the recorded EMG. So basically, the task now is how well do you predict the measured data, mm. right? If, and we've just submitted a paper, yeah, it went in hopefully yesterday, um, about using static optimization with the same criteria, right? Um, and again, what we've done is this is an unknown thing or it's known to people who do rigid body modelling is that open sim, if the muscle models with activation cannot generate the joint torques, and it happens all the time, it pulls in these things called reserve actuators. Basically, they're theoretical joint torque generators on different joints to make the difference up. And sometimes muscles cannot generate the torques and sometimes they overpredict it because the activation patterns, because it's time based, you can overpredict joint torques. Mm -hmm. So you stick in positive and negative <coughs> reserve actuators, they're fudge factors to make it equal. Right. So we remove yeah, that. Yeah, Higgs bosons. Sorry? Yeah, Higgs bosons. <laughs> <laughs> right. right, thanks, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I might put that one in there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Call the hand of God yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So the idea is. So we took those out and saw how well a static optimization model would actually predict all the joint moments and then how much an EMG informed would actually predict all the joint moments and activation patterns, both. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is static optimization couldn't predict the activation patterns, but it predicted the joint moments to the same level of accuracy as the EMG informed method. But the EMG informed method predicted both joint moments and muscle activation patterns. Right, yeah. Well. Yeah. So in other words, you've got to change your mindset. You go, well, how far am I getting away from the measured data? Right. That's the criteria. Um, and that's really my answer. And now we have to be creative about all the other types of data that we can collect or generate. The other one that which we're toying with now is that joint powers are readily calculated um, using inverse dynamics and inverse kinetics. Joint powers are equally well cal easily calculated by having muscular tendon models because we know how fast they're contracting, we can generate joint powers from them. But again, we have another data, set of data that we can bring into this validation part. So we can just, and there's joint stiffness. Right. We actually have models, EMG driven stiffness in the models now. Um, it's not readily available, but um, so you can measure joint stiffness using an, an external method and predict it. So in other words, so once we start collecting more data, we'll have plenty of data to validate the models. And that's really what it is. You have data to benchmark your models. Right, yeah. And that's in the neuromuscular skeletal modelling, but it's also when I start putting in image-based um, anatomical models mm -hmm. into that as well. What you'd expect is that when I put image-based anatomical models in there, that I get better and better at predicting all the other measured data. Right. Yeah. We're not there yet, but yeah. we should be there. Like Ash. Really nice talk. We enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, um, could you comment or do you know anything about where we are at right now in, um, in say, a, a, a joint replacement where you have navigation techniques or you have uh, ideas of range of motion that's very passive, and, uh, but, but really no idea on, on how this implant is going to work for this person when they're walking about? Um, Short answer for that is, I'll let Tor answer it. Now, um, <laughs> I, I think the answer to that is we don't know yet. Because we haven't had the models to actually analyse um, the data that we recorded about migration and failure rates of implants. We just haven't had that data. Until we get that data and fill in that pathway, then we can start to analyse why these things are failing. All right? And even more so is because we can go into the model and change alignment um, of the implant in the, in the rigid body model and in the fine element model, we can change those alignments and see what it actually does to the stresses and strain on the implant and in the bone around the implant. And then we can start inferring some mechanobiological remodelling, which bad and good remodelling, which is actually going on causing loosening and migration. 
I think that's the way forward here for implant work. And we can do it for the hip, knee. What the criteria are, I know, ask an orthopedic surgeon. You know, this is, as one of my um, orthopedic surgeon colleagues says, orthopedic surgery is very empirical. You know, um, so I said it's very empirical, and he said, oh, we guess. Um, and it's based upon what my guru said to me. No, um, that's basically it. And there's good surgeons and there's bad surgeons. That's actually the fact. And everyone's got different criteria. The catchphrase at the moment is kinematic alignment of the knee as opposed to anatomic alignment. And I ask, I quiz them and say, what do you mean by that? Oh, you know, do you actually mean motion? No, we need forces as well. Well, that's kinetics, that's forces. So I don't, know, I don't get it. So do you know how it actually changes? And no. Um, that's where they are at the moment. They don't know how to put the joint best in. Here's the other factor as well. Um, even in a small orthopedic company, which has different sizes and different size components, and there's about a thousand different combinations of implants, like a patellofemoral, a patella implant versus the tibial implant, and the tibial component and the femoral component, and the, and the patella component. You can pick and choose. In the end, these guys just go small, medium, large. And I just go, that's what they do. Um, even just doing that, you can improve what we're doing now by going, well, this is going to fit the anatomy better, this is going to fit the loading patterns better, and the articular surfaces better, whatever they might be, um, because they're buggered at that point in time. Um, that's a technical term for it. Um, is, so, I don't know. Um, but I, I know the framework in which we can answer that question. And I think, and this is the other thing, I hope there's no orthopedic surgeons here. Stick your hands up. No. Oh, no orthopedic surgeon. Look, some of, my best, some of my best friends are orthopedic surgeons. They're lovely people. I just don't want to meet them in the surgery. Um, the, the issue is a successful knee replacement has 2% failure rates. That's their very best. That's two people in the 98. Think if an aeroplane had 2% success failure rates. Think if a car had 2% failure rates. Think if a bridge had a 2% failure rates. Right? We don't, as an engineering sense, we don't actually don't work in that space. We're mu now, I, I understand there's a whole lot of biological and mechanical variability, but I'm sure we can do a damn sight better job than 2% if we actually do it right. If we actually design it using a personalised digital models. And I think there's enough, very, I think what we've learnt from personalised modelling, the more personal you make the model, the better its predictions are on all different uh, senses. And, and some of them can, you know, you can halve the contact forces just by changing some of the parameters in the model, even if it's anatomically correct. You know, it's, and you can change activation patterns, you can completely unload the lateral compartment to being loaded. You know, it can change by 200 newtons, 300 newtons, like, you know, that's a big difference on on a component and a bone. <laughs> so. so I think that's a good place to end it. Personal, okay. Personalized medicine. Yes. Uh, but if you have other questions, feel free to stick around. We have beer and wine and chips in the, the whole bit. Um, so with that, let's thank David once more for his talk. Thank you.